So the next uh, uh, topic that we want to cover is vision transformers. So we are going to follow uh, this the, the paper with the title "An Image Is Worth An Image Is Worth Sixteen by Sixteen Words." by these authors. Again, I'm not going to there pronounce it. Okay. So here's the problem. We have transformers, encoders and decoders, but let's say just the encoder part. It works really well on NLP applications for translations for other NLP related applications. So how can we use, you know, even before that, can we use transformers for on images for vision applications? For example, for image classification, segmentation, detection, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So what are the potential issues in using transformers for images. Obviously they were not they designed for for images. Uh, they designed they were designed for uh, for NLP tasks because of the, you know, the the way that they handle their inputs. But let's say if I want to use them on images, so what are the potential issues? So what are the really key differences between the two domains that we need to uh, somehow handle uh, if you want to use transformers on images. Okay, so um, you're talking about embeddings. Embeddings are what? Okay, so that's a that that's that's a good angle. So uh, let me uh, take one more answer. Yes, quadratic memory. <laughs> Maybe uh, I don't know. Like, uh, but I'm looking uh, for something even simpler and perhaps uh, a little bit more uh, fundamental. Uh, someone in the back. Yes, you. Exactly, right? So the, the input to the encoder, remember, is a vectorized version of my tokens. Let's say you, you have a board, it's a discrete board, discrete element. Let's say I, you, like ice cream or something. So you, we vectorize it, you get, we get a vector, right? Add a positional embedding and then you pass it through your, uh, your model. Okay, so, but, in images, we do have um, we do have like inputs. Right? So in NLP, in fact, it was you know I would say it was a little bit more difficult to tackle tackle words because they're discrete, right? So we had to like go through like uh, vectorization and get like vector embeddings using you know word to vec. Uh, but images they they have real numbers. So maybe that is even easier. So can I imagine each pixel is a token for me? And it's, it's, it has a real value, right? So I don't need to go through like the vectorization. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be even easier for my, uh, for my task? Because I don't need to go through like the, the, the word to vec uh, process. Yes. Redundant. Redundancy is not bad, right? So, as input, so you have more information. Right? So, why should I be worried about redundancy? Uh, you at the back. Exactly. 
Excellent. So, yeah, so of course I can consider each pixel as a token, but you are going to have a lot of tokens. Uh, just imagine, you know, you have um, images with a resolution of, let's say, 256 by 256, you are going to have more than 60,000 tokens. That basically corresponds to like a processing a text with 60,000 words. If you have an image with like 1080 to uh, 1920 resolution, you're going to have 2 million tokens that you need to process. So that is computationally difficult. So that is the, 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 the first issue. Okay, so how can I summarize that? Um, in NLP, okay. Um, no natural notion of tokens. So if we consider, if we consider each pixel as a token, then we have too many tokens. For example, for an image of size 256 to 256, which is not an uh, basically an unusual resolution, you will have more than 60,000 tokens. Expensive. So how can we uh, solve this problem? So the idea that was uh, proposed was to, okay, let's not look at images at a pixel resolution. Let's look at like, you know, bunch of pixels together. Like, that's the issue that we had, right? That we had like too many pixels as individual tokens. It's just like, you know, group pixels, you know, maybe look at like 10 of them together or 20 of them together or maybe like hundreds of them together. So how can I group pixels on images? That is easy, right? Um, and I can consider them as like a group so I can look at them as one token. Yes? You can do some sort of order, whether it's average or not. That's like way too fancy for, for my taste. <laughs> Something even simpler, right? So you have an image, you know, before you could uh, look at each pixel, right? So I'm going to like draw like 60,000 points here. Just hold up. <laughs> I, I'm not going to do that. But like, how can I, how can I, what, what is like the, the simplest way of grouping pixels? But like, you know, someone who hasn't, yes, you. Use patches, thank you, God bless you. All right, so <laughs> that's it, right? So that's the whole idea. So cut your images into patches. And then each patch, you can just flatten it, right? So it's a vector. You don't need to do like, you know, word embedding. That, that's already a vector. Maybe the, the, the size of the patch is big. Maybe you can do like a linear embedding. You don't need to do like a you know, board embedding. You can do a linear projection to, uh, to reduce the dimensionality of the vectors. Uh, that's optional, but um, uh, it already comes in real domains. Right? That's the main idea of uh, transformer. So here is my input image. I want to use a transformer. Trans Former. So I'm going to have my, my patches 16 by 16. That's the design choice that they had. That's why you know there's a 16 by 16 in the in the title. So I'm going to have these patches of size 16 by 16 as my input tokens, vectorize them, and instead of word to vec embedding, we really don't need to do that. But 16 by 16 may be a little bit, you know, longer than what, uh, you know, we would have liked. Maybe uh, we can do a linear projection here. Okay. 
linear projection and map it to the dimensionality that uh, we desire. So, so these are going to be my uh, input vectors to my encode to my transformer, uh, which is the encoder part of the transform. The rest is the same as before. I'm going to need to add positional encoding vectors to each of them. So positional encoding vector uh, corresponding to position one, position two to position n. So that is uh, that is the way that we uh, we handle. Let me look at the time. So yeah. So the output of the transformer will be how many vectors? The same number of vectors as my patches, because the number of patches that I have is like that is the number of my input tokens. So I'm going to have one vector per 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 patch, okay, good, easy. So in other words, like thinking about patches as my tokens. Okay, so if I wanna solve image classification, that's the most standard vision task, solving for, uh, let's say, classification problem uh, on image. So I need to, let's say I have an image, I mean, decompose it to the patches, I have all of these vectors. So I need to then do some sort of classification on top of it. So you can have uh, various options. Right? So what are the ideas that you can, so how can I use the output of your encoder for the classification task? Yes? You can maybe add a layer, um, take these vectors, then you know use that layer to predict you know a particular label right so that that's not a bad idea so can i use um only one of them and pass it through that layer instead of you know passing through like you know all of these tokens would it would that be a good idea for let's say a classification task It, it has like a little bit of all information, but uh, because there's like attention, attention layer across patches, right? But perhaps the information for this vector is going to be dominated by the information of that particular patch. Maybe it has a little bit, you know, of information of the context, but it is more focused on that patch, right? So what about this one? So again, it has the same problem. So in order to have just one output vector that I can use for the classification, uh, they use a trick that uh, was, uh, I think, originally introduced in another paper. Okay. That they add a, basically a dummy token, it's called CLS token, to the input, CLS token. So the embedding for this token is learnable. It means that I don't know like what it is at the beginning, even the input em embedding. I'm going to add again the, the positional um, encoding uh, for uh, corresponding to location zero. And I'll treat this token, suppose that you have an initialization for this token, right? so all, you know, one. So your encoder is going to spit out a vector corresponding to this CLS token as well. So this is going to be the output for corresponding to the CLS token. So we are going to use this output, say push it through an MLP, multi-layer perceptron, and solve a classification task. And this works pretty well. 
And the idea here is that the, the, the CLS token, it is kind of a, a placeholder, a virtual token. It is not really tied to any particular patch that, you know, whose information is dominated by the information of that patch. So hopefully it has somehow, and the output of it has somehow an, a summarization or an aggregation of information across different uh, patches. But who knows, right? So empirically, this works. Uh, there, there are works that they tried like other ways. You can combine other vectors, you can use that. Um, uh, that's also good uh, as well. But uh, in, in, in the paper, they proposed to use this particular uh, approach and uh, that's uh, what we are going to uh, go with for now. Okay. So then we are good, right? That's it, that's vision transform. We are excited, we go and apply on, let's say what is the most standard classification, uh, benchmark for the classification, image. Right? So we go and apply, go and apply on ImageNet. And given the, the power of vision transformers, we think that the transformers, we think that the vision version of it should really be much, much better than the old fashioned, you know, out of fashion convolutional networks like ResNets. Right? So that this is the expectation. So the question is, does this happen? What do you think? It doesn't happen. So if you use transformer, uh, the way that I explained on ImageNet, in fact, ResNets are still better than transformers. So why do you think that is the case? Yes. Exactly, right? So CNNs and convolution networks, they were designed for images. Right? So they are, for example, translation invariant, which is you know something that we have for image classification. If you translate pixels, the label is not going to change. They have like some notion of localization, you know, like the pixels nearby, they, you know, usually they, you know, correspond to the same object or the same segment. With transformers, what are we doing? We are just like chopping off images, like to patches. The positional encoding, the way that I described, it doesn't use even like the 2D information. You're just like you know, basically like doing zero, one, two, three to like basically to the number of tokens that you have. The only place so far you use like the 2D information in the images like to define patches, that's it. There's no notion of localization. There's no notion of, for example, uh, translation invariance. So not unexpected because they don't have, don't have, proper inductive inductive bias for images compared to uh, compared to uh, CNNs and convolution networks. All right, so how can we fix it? How can we come up with a solution to uh, deal with this problem, the case? So last time we discussed, it is because of the inductive bias of convolution networks. Convolution networks are originally designed and developed on images. So the way that the convolution works, it is basically imposing some inductive bias on images. It is translation uh, invariant. So if you um, move an object left or right, up or down, it really doesn't change your, uh, the output of your convolution. Um, it has some um, localization because these filters are applied locally on, on images and on you know, images you have like local objects. Right? So you don't have like 
one piece of information here, one piece of information in the other side of the room. In transformers, we really don't use that. So just think about like this idea. Where did I use the 2D information, the spatial information from the image? So the only place that I use that information is to coming up with patches because we don't, you know, like group pixels that are far from each other as a patch. So we look at like the, the, the pixels that are nearby each other as a patch. But even the, the current patching that we have may not respect the geometry of an object. You may you know, chop off an object. If you have an animal, maybe like the, the leg is going to be in one patch. Maybe you, you know, have very weird uh, divisions uh, in terms of the, in terms of the you know, semantics uh, in your patches. But like that's the only information to the information that we have used. So how can we fix it? So the question is that, is it fixable? Do we need to change the architecture in order to deal with, with this problem? Yes. No, because that doesn't take into account the 2D information. Perhaps you can maybe use some 2D information saying that, okay, so for positional encodings, you know, for the nearby patches, they should be somehow relevant to each other. But that is also probably a weak way of using the 2D information of the image in your, in your model. But yeah, absolutely, you can, you can do that in fact. Um, there, there are models that they, I'll talk about. Yes. A lot of attention on between the closer patches that uh, at the top left corner need not be packed at the bottom right and then you can start up in the top of position. Fantastic. So your friend's idea is that, okay, look, I want to use the spatial information, the 2D information somehow in my model, right? So maybe I can have some sort of inductive bias through my prior on the attention, right? Saying that, okay, maybe um, for patches that are nearby each other, they should get like the more attention bait <clears throat> compared to the rest of the rest of the edges, attention edges. I think that that's a good idea. I like it, but that's not the solution I'm looking for. Yes. Yeah, you can do that, but again, you are relying on convolution, right? So we. For, for the sake of today's lecture, we hate convolutions, right? So we don't wanna talk to them, we don't wanna touch them, you know, we, we don't like them, right? So we only want to use pure attention, uh, attention-based architecture. In fact, like before this paper, there were like attempts to use something that you proposed, like a hybrid of convolutions plus, you know, some, some sort of attentions in order to overcome this problem. Uh, but we are looking for a pure attention-based architecture. So one more, and uh, we'll talk about some, uh, some way of dealing with this problem. You already, you already, uh, so yes, Mehta? Patches of different sizes. I like that idea, but how, like, how do I know like which sizes I should use? And second of all, would that solve the, the underlying problem I'm dealing with? You know, I'm okay with patches with the same sizes for now, right? But like the issue that I have is like, I don't have that inductive bias. 
I don't have the, the geometric information, the, the local information of objects in an image. All right, so So the second issue that we talked is that transformers lack proper inductive biases for images. Obviously compared to convolution neural networks. For example, they don't have translation um, invariance or locality. And obviously it is because they haven't been designed originally for images. All right, so the solution that the, this paper proposed is quite a simple solution, is to overcome this by just adding more data to the train. So train your vision transformer, not on millions of samples, train it on hundreds of millions of samples. And if you want to use it on smaller data sets, you can fine tune the pre-trained model. So basically they overcome the lack of inductive bias in the model by just scaling up the data for training the transformer model, right? So here's the solution, pre-train your vision transformer on a much larger data set, let's say between 15 to 300 million images. And then fine tune it, fine tune only the classification head. The classification head on smaller data sets like image. So this approach works very well. And not only that, right? So if you're uh, pre-training your transformer, so you have, you have this pre-trained vision transformer, your fine tuning is pretty lighthead because you're just fine tuning your MLP uh, that can be done very effectively. And even for pre-training, you can take advantage of parallelization in training your transformer on large number of training samples. So that's the advantage in terms of the training speed. And um, the empirical results, um, it is very promising. So they can, uh, in the paper, you can look at the numbers. I won't go through them. Um, they have shown significant improvements over convolution networks. But obviously there's a catch here, right? So we are using much more data in our training. And so is it fair to, let's say, train pre-train my vision transformer on 100 million samples and then fine tune it on a million sample and compare it with the CNN only trained on a million sample? That's not a fair comparison, but even if you compare a, a ResNet trained on 300 plus 1 million samples with the vision transformers, in that scale, vision transformers um, outperform convolution networks. So the, 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 the advantage of transformers for images, it becomes more evident in that regime. If you have smaller data set and you don't have a pre-trained model, the vision transformer is not going to give you advantage compared to ResNets on images because of the lack of their inductive biases. 
Okay. Um, so obviously there are some minor um, technical points, some minor technical points. I don't know how how much uh, details I should go into. Um, so one uh, one difference uh, in the transformer architecture that they have compared to the original one is that they make positional embeddings also learnable instead of like being fixed. Positional embeddings also learnable. But perhaps the more important uh, distinction is the following. So usually it is better to fine tune at a high resolution compared to your pre-training. In the pre-training, it is okay to not go like super high resolution. But like in fine tuning, it is empirically shown that it is better to look at high resolution images, images with more pixels basically. By high resolution, that's what I mean. So it is better, better to fine tune at higher resolution compared to resolution used in pre-training. And since we are keeping the patch sizes fixed, in the fine tuning, we'll have many more patches because Patches are 16 by 16, you know, you have like in the fine tuning, higher resolution, uh, higher resolution images. Um, that's completely fine because transformers, they don't expect to see the same number of patches. That's the flexibility of the transformers because again, since they're originally developed for text, text can be, that it can come in different length. It can be like three tokens, it can be like 100 tokens. So that can be handled but the only um, technical issue is that you now your positional embeddings can, for the high resolution case, may not correspond to the positional embeddings that you already trained for the, for the low resolution case in your pre-training. And for that, uh, they uh, use interpolation. So you have, uh, you have an image, you have like some positional embeddings on patches in the low resolution, to get the positional embeddings in the high resolution, you can just interpolate, uh, get those positional embeddings. It's a minor technical issue. Uh, if you see it somewhere, I just wanna um, make sure that you have this in there. Maybe I can use a different color. Positional embeddings. Um, no longer meaningful as we use to the interpolation of previous positional embeds. Okay, so this is the second second place. Where 2D information used. Right? So the first place is in patching. We are using the 2D information. The only other place that we are using the 2D information of the images is this interpolation of your uh, positional embedding vectors. Right? So you have like one positional embedding, another positional embedding, another positional embedding. Now you have a higher resolution. If you want to have a positional embedding here, you're just interpolating between, between these two vectors. Right? That's the, another place that we are using the 2D information. But in a way, we are ignoring the source of the problem. Right? We are ignoring the fact that transformers, they don't have prior inductive biases, and we try to overcome it by just scaling up the data. So there's a debate whether or not this is a good approach in the long term. 
uh, that we can just scale up the data and hopefully that will resolve all of uh, all of the issues that we have uh, without us really going into the source of the, the, the issues and trying to properly um, properly address them. Um, all right, so that was about the first paper about vision transformers. Um, and that's, uh, that's a, a very important paper, obviously. So let me pause here, see if there are any questions. And after that, I'll talk about another, um, another um, architecture for vision transformer. It's called Swine Architecture. Uh, that can overcome some of the issues that we already discussed. So I'll take uh, one or two questions here. Yes? Does the vision transformer contain each order? Good. So for, for the sake of the classification problem, only the encoder. And so I don't, I don't need to decode uh, anything. Um, here I'm using the CLS uh, encoded vector to do the classification problem. But for some other application, you may want to add a similar decoder on top of the, the encoder if you want to have something like an autoencoder architecture. So, like so for the encoder part, no. Right? So it is trained exactly the way that we have trained. So I haven't talked about like masking at this point. So it is trained exactly the way that we discussed about like, you know, the the training um, of the original transfer. So no masking at this point. One more, yes? So why, why, do, why do you think by adding more data, like what happens in the next work because of adding the data and then the You tell me. <laughs> right, so um, I think, OK, so um, first of all, it is an empirical observation. So I, um, I don't think we have a good justification. But if you want to have an intuition about it, so there are two ways of somehow, and this is the way I'm thinking about the problem, right? And it can be completely inaccurate. But there are two ways of like imposing some sort of properties in terms of your distribution. One is that, OK, so you impose that in the architecture level, saying that, OK, so I want locality, I want uh, translation invariance, so you don't really need to deal with those issues in terms of your data. The other way is data augmentation. Right? So we have seen that is quite effective, even in training um, convolution networks. What is, what is data augmentation? You're basically having different views, maybe corrupted versions, even like adversarial training, you can think about it as data augmentation. Right? So you may have like other versions of image and you are teaching your network, you're teaching your model, okay, look, all of these, they represent the same object or similar object. Okay, so that increases the robustness of your model uh, with respect to those types of transformations. When you have more data, obviously you have more diversity in your data. So you get perhaps objects in different backgrounds. Maybe there are already some translated versions of not the same object, but you know, object uh, with the same label, but with different properties in another uh, position on your image. And that somehow uh, overcomes when you're really scaling up your data, the lack of inductive bias. So that's a really, um, I would say, hand wavy. Uh, explanation of why uh, scaling can be helpful, but I don't believe it uh, personally, I don't believe scaling will lead to um, reliable and dependable models at the end of the day, because we don't have, unless we have like a controlled scaling, we don't really know what types of data we are adding. What is the tail of the distribution? Uh, are there like some uncommon situations that we are completely missing? and even though we are scaling up the data, still the model is going to struggle over those subpopulations and many other related uh, problems. But good question.